We are in Psalm 41. Tonight, Compassion for the Poor. Psalm 41. Go ahead and begin reading that. Psalm 41. Blessed is he that considered the poor. The Lord will deliver him in, his, in, in a time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed in his sickness. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Hear my soul. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Mine enemies speak evil of me. When shall he die and his name perish? And if he come to me to seek me, he speaketh vanity. His heart gathereth iniquity to itself. When he goeth abroad, he telleth it. All that hate me whisper together against me, against me do they devise my hurt. An evil disease, say they, cleaveth fast unto him, and now he that lieth, now that he lieth, he shall rise up no more. Yea, mine unfamiliar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me, and raise me up, that I may requite them. By this I know that thou favorest me, because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. And as for me, thou upholdest me in my integrity, and setteth me before thy face forever. Blessed be the Lord of Israel, the Lord God of Israel, from everlasting and to everlasting. Amen and amen. Now this uh, passage of scripture, we'll break it down this way. Uh, first is uh, verses 1 through 3, God's mercy for the compassionate. Uh, verses uh, 4 through 9, David states his case. Of course, I'll repeat this. Uh, verse 10, he proceeds in prayer. And verse 11 through 13, he closes with thanksgiving. So we'll look at that one more time. Verses 1 through 3, God's mercy for the compassionate. And verses 4 through 9, David states his case. And at verse 10, he proceeds in prayer. And verse 11 through 13, he closes with thanksgiving. So this is our passage tonight. It is a, uh, a passage about how God is going to bless those who are compassionate towards the poor. He says that in the beginning, God's mercy is for the compassionate. He says, blessed is the man that considereth the poor. You know, it's uh, a blessing to consider the poor. Uh, it, it is the idea of... Um, uh, God's uh, favor is upon the, those who consider the poor. God is merciful to them. He blesses them. You're going to reap what you sow is the point of this verse verse. You're going to reap what you sow. You know, when we're stingy and we look down upon people and we're not willing to help people, then when it is our time of trouble, we won't be delivered. It's going to be difficult for us. We need to consider the poor, and to consider the poor means to stop and think about them. To consider the poor means to uh, and observe their situation. You know, sometimes we are met with people who are who claim to be poor and help and need help, and in fact, they aren't poor. Uh, I've seen people that have. Uh, we have a lot of uh, homeless people in this area. I've seen people drive up in cars, get out, and put on their sign and go out and and uh, ask for money, and they have a house, and they have a car, and they have everything, and they're just pretending. So it says consider the poor. You know, we ought to think about what we're doing and be considerate, not only of their needs, but we ought to be discerning as to how we give someone's money. Sometimes we find that people are poor on purpose because they want to be homeless, or they want to be on drugs, and they don't want to have a, a normal uh, life where they work and they eat and they have they they have these things and they want to be poor, and so for that uh, we say that uh, we need discernment. Uh, it might be a mistake for you to hand out cash to some people, and so we would be considerate of them. But in a general sense, we need to take uh, consideration for the poor. You know, there are people who are genuinely in need, and we need to be thoughtful and and try to help them. Our time of need has either already come or will come. And it ought to be something where we have compassion and not look down and despise them. But he says, blessed is he that considereth the poor. You know, you stop and you think, what would, what would it be like if I was in this situation? How would, I, how would I feel? What would I do? You know, some people won't ask for help. But uh, you can see that they have some needs. And some people are good at asking for help. They're used to it. 
And so it's actually kind of hard to help them because they want to ask you and they want to keep asking you. And you know that if you help them, they're going to continue to ask. So you have to be discerning. But nonetheless, to consider that their needs takes a little bit of compassion. It takes a little bit of thought. It takes a little bit of intention to be thoughtful. And that is what God is expressing to us to consider the poor. You know, there are poor who need help. Uh, there are poor people who are poor in the finances, and there are poor people who are poor in spirit as well. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. There are people who need spiritual guidance, and we ought to consider their needs and be thoughtful towards them and try to help them. But uh, here he says, uh, the Lord will deliver them in times of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth. You know, God's a compassionate God. We serve a compassionate God. Therefore, we ought to be compassionate people. Since we serve a God of compassion, His, His attributes should be reflecting in our lives. And we should then be compassionate people. God is compassionate. God gives us the great salvation of, from His Son. He gives us salvation, forgiveness of sins. He gives mercy. And that means that God is a very merciful God, a very compassionate God. And we need to uh, recognize how good He is. He says that He'll preserve them and keep them alive. You know, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. You're going to live. Even if you die, you'll live. Because of our merciful and compassionate God. He says He gives mercy to the merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And therefore, we recognize that when we uh, see the attributes of God in our life, we can be comforted that we have seen a portion of heaven poured out upon our souls. And God is a great God of compassion. Therefore, it should make us compassionate. He saves. Let's look over in Luke chapter 6. If you would turn over to the book of Luke chapter 6. In the book of Luke, Jesus says this in chapter third, chapter six, and our verse is verse thirty-eight. It says, "Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful." You know, God is faithful, and God gives, and He's forgiving, and uh, we need to remember that God is merciful, and we need to be merciful as well. God is merciful. Be merciful as your Father also is merciful. You know, it's, it's the right thing for us to do to be merciful in response to the mercy we've uh, enjoyed from God. And therefore, uh, we're told, forgive one another as Christ forgave you. You know, it ought not to be in the life of a Christian that they cannot forgive. It ought not to be that you say, well, uh, I, I'm a Christian, but I'm not going to forgive that person. Now, there ought to be something dramatically wrong with that in your heart and mind to think that God could forgive you, a traitor, a rebel, of all your sins that you did against an infinitely wise and holy God. And yet, you wouldn't be able to forgive somebody who's offended you, who's a sinner, a rebel, and not deserving of anything in this life. Not deserving of good treatment. And that you would not be able to forgive that person is a bad sign about grace in your heart. It ought to be something where we recognize that if we're going to claim to be Christians, then we forgive as Christ forgave us. Let's not hold grudges. Let us be forgiving. Let us be merciful. And God will be good to us. God will favor us. He won't do it on account of our being forgiving. He won't do it on account of our being merciful. He won't do it as we earn. We won't earn anything from Him by those things. But those, that is the natural response of a Christian. I want to be merciful. I want to be forgiving. Beware of grudges. Beware of being unmerciful. Beware of being uncompassionate. You know, we, we, we recognize that we are not to do certain things. And so those things we try to avoid. And then there are things we try to do. God tells us to worship on Sunday. And He tells us to uh, raise up our children for God. And He tells us to do certain things and we do them. But be careful not to be unmerciful. Be careful not to be unforgiving. Be careful to have these graces in your heart. They are graces from Christ. If you are, um, uh, if you are, um, if you're in a situation where you're not experiencing and expressing these graces, then you need to stop and recognize that it's not enough 
to just not do certain things. It's not enough to try to do certain things, but it's enough when your spirit reflects the Spirit of God, who is merciful, who is forgiving, who is tenderhearted, who is compassionate, he has all these things and he gives them to his children. And so we need to then uh, reflect them and reflect them as, it's, it's as important as abstaining from certain sins and doing other things that he's told us to do. Uh, it, it is the graces of God are how we reflect the person of Christ. Therefore, if we are contentious, if we are uncompassionate, if we're unforgiving, if we hold grudges, if we're complaining or miserable, we are not reflecting the Spirit of Christ. And we need to stop and say, do I want to live as a Christian? It's not enough just to not do certain things. It's not enough just to do certain things. We need to have the graces of these, uh, this, these, uh, these fruits of the Holy Spirit in our life. It's, we've got to pursue them. And we've got to have them, and we have to make them our own. Jesus says we're to be uh, forgiving, just and, mer and merciful as our Father is merciful. So shall you be called the sons of your Father in heaven. Now we go on in verse 4. He says, I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. You know, David starts to state his case. And he's suffering from his sin. You know, we're going to suffer on account of our sins. We're going to suffer on account of them. Sometimes we will suffer on account of our past sins. We'll suffer because in this present time, it is not possible to erase all of the uh, consequences of all of our past sin. So, for instance, if you have... Uh, excuse me. Stop. Can you stop it? Thank you. Put that down. Thank you, Sam. Good. Okay. Put it down. It is um, impossible, for, I mean, it's possible for us to have, uh, for instance, if you have committed a, a crime, and that goes upon your record, and you go to apply for a um, certain position, and they look at that, and they see it, it's not going to be erased because you became a Christian. Uh, if you have, um, uh, if you've had a, uh, a problem in your marriage, and you've made errors, and great errors, against your husband or your wife, then that will not just erase because each of you forgive each other. You still have to work upon it and you have to deal with it and you, it, will be a, it will be a difficulty. If you go through your life and uh, you have had a difficult upbringing in your, as, your, uh, as a child, you'll take that into your marriage and it will be a difficulty in your marriage. You'll have to deal with these things. So all of your weaknesses and your errors and especially your sins can cause you difficulties even though you've asked God to forgive you and He has they still can cause trouble. Our past sins can cause us trouble. But he says, I have sinned. Be merciful to, unto me, uh, for I have sinned against thee. You know, sometimes our present sins cause us trouble. Our present sins. Our present sins cause us trouble too. Sometimes we make a mistake. We made a mistake this week or last week, or we made a, we 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 um, committed some sin today or, or recently, and it, it it bothers us. And what happens when you sin is this: just like Adam and Eve, I want you to always remember this. What is the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they sinned? They uh, realized they were naked, they, which represents that they had shame. Then. The next thing they did is they sowed fig leaves to cover their shame. And the next thing they did is they hid from God. And I want you to remember that when you sin, the first thing you're going to do is hide from God when you experience that shame. And so what do you do when you hide from God? Well, you make excuses. Uh, you will uh, try to cover your way so that you feel more comfortable with yourself. And you will also become angry and lash out at anyone who gets close to your sin because you don't want anybody to expose it to you, even to your own heart, even though you know you did it. You don't want anybody pointing it out, so you'll be angry and you'll lash out. And that's, that's uh, perfectly normal. I'm not saying it's right, but that's normal human response. And so our present sins will cause us trouble. And we need to recognize that when we find ourselves having anger or lashing out, or we have our, find ourselves having um, difficulty in those areas, it could be from our present sin we need to deal with that, and uh, we need to stop those things and confess them. But our present sins can cause us trouble too. 
But notice he says, uh, he says, I have sinned. You know, when you sin against God, the thing you need to do is stop and confess it and walk with God again. Mm -hmm. It is the great thing about Christianity that He is willing to forgive you of your sin. Mm -hmm. And therefore, though you sin against Him, He can forgive you and you can continue to walk in fellowship with God. Mm -hmm. And when a righteous man falls down, he stops and gets right with God and he seeks to ask forgiveness and get back up. We can get back up and we can keep walking. We can get back up and we can have to restore fellowship with God. We can get back up. And that's a wonderful thing about our Savior. He's yeah. not going to hold the grudge. He's not going to uh, be a respecter of persons. He's not going to be partial against us and say, you know, you've sinned this sin before and I forgave you three times and I think I'm out of forgiveness for you. I'm not going to do it again. He will forgive you. Yeah. And you can get up and walk with God again. And you can be a, a man or a woman as God requires and you can enjoy your relationship with God. And therefore we say, praise God, if we've sinned, we can say, I have sinned. And that's what you need to do. First thing is, sooner the better, I have sinned, God please forgive me. And once you do, then you don't have to worry about the shame. You don't have to worry about the hiding from God. You don't have to worry about the anger and the excuses. You can just simply go on worshiping the Lord and look for His healing and find forgiveness. And that's a good thing. So he says, I have sinned against thee. He says, mine enemies speak evil of me. When shall he die and his name perish? You know, we have enemies. We have them all around. We've got enemies within. We've got enemies without. And the enemies, they hate the light. And they try to put it out. You can see that in the life of Christ. The first thing that they wanted to do when they realized that a king had been born, Herod wanted to kill all the children, kill the babies. He wanted to kill the, uh, the babies and put, put away the opposing king. And when they found out that the Messiah was here and that uh, the king of heaven had come down and they, they heard him claim that he was the son of God, they wanted to kill him. They didn't believe him, they wanted to kill him. They said he's a blasphemer. They wanted to put him right over the edge of a cliff and they wanted to crucify him and they did. And that is what, the, that is what, it, that's what sin's response is to the light. Kill it. Kill it. And don't be surprised if they want you to stop. Stop speaking about Christ. Stop uh, giving the gospel. Stop putting, your, uh, putting Christ out before someone. They, don't be surprised if sinners get tired of the message and want to stop you. Because it is a message that is offensive to sin. It confronts sin. It tells the flesh you can't be in charge. There's a, there is a true king and he is... God from heaven. And therefore, when people hear that message, they realize that you've come to ask the king to step down off his throne, that is the sinner. You've come to ask the sinner to get on his knees and, and stop being king and start getting humbled. Take that crown off your head, it's not yours. It's Jesus Christ's king crown. And he wants to forgive you what you've done, but you're going to have to humble yourself before him. And therefore, we find that sinners don't like that message. They get upset and they want to kill and they want to stop. They want to put the lights out and they say, when shall he die and his name perish? It would be better if this man were dead so we wouldn't have to hear his message. But you need to be merciful and your life is a rebuke to them. As you are, have that compassion for the poor, as you have that forgiveness and you offer forgiveness to somebody, why, there you are rebuking them without a word. You ever seen that rebuke without a word? You don't even have to say anything. You just wake up, uh, speak out there, and next thing you know, the person is uh, saying, what are you saying? What are you doing? What do you mean by that? And you're just simply telling, speaking the truth, trying to live right. And people get offended by it. They get hurt by it. But they hope that you fall. They expect you to fail. And uh, they want you to be destroyed, it says here. Uh, and if... And, uh, when shall he die and his name perish? And if he come to see me, he speak of vanity. His heart gather iniquity to itself. When he goeth abroad, he telleth it. You know, he, he comes to speak vanity. Give him a notch there, please. Hey. Go to your other spot. Thank you. Now, uh, the, the, this verse 6 here says, If he comes to see me, speak of vanity. You know, the worldly system is going to speak lies to you. It's going to speak lies to you, and you need, we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware that we ought not to trust this world system. 
This world system is here to deceive you into first thinking it's your friend and second destroying you, your kids, your future, your heritage, everything that God is trying to build, the Satan, that Satan is trying to destroy. We need to recognize that. There's a, uh, I guess there's another installment of the Star Wars movie come out this week. And uh, this week they're, they're going to run the, I don't know if it's number seven movie, I don't know what it is, but they're going to run it this week. And uh, people are, are, are asking the question, uh, should Christians go to a, see Star Wars? And you know, the question is just a simple one. Can we trust this world system to lead us right? And it is a dangerous system, and the system is based on this principle. We'll lie to you so that we can seek your death and destruction. We will we'll deceive you in order to get you to trust us, but in vanity is in our heart. And that's what the movies are, and that's what you'll find there. You'll find that they pack it all up with pretties. They put the sugar coating over it with the computer graphics and the excitement and the music and the, the explosions and all the, uh, the, the storyline, the interaction between characters and the violence. And all those things are just, they're just, um, they're just trimmings so that they can deliver to you the vanity that's underneath and lie to you. And what they do is they get you drawn in with all the peripherals so as you go to see all the excitement, but there's a storyline underneath it that's vanity. And it's here to deceive you and to destroy you. You say, well, I saw that movie, it didn't bother me. Well, if you probably, if we can say, if you saw that movie and you think it didn't affect you, then you definitely have been affected by this world system. Because what it has done is it's desensitized you. You should be able to look at that and say, you know, that's nothing for a Christian. A Christian doesn't need to be exposed to that kind of stuff. It's a, it's a, a worldly allurement that's going to draw me in and it's going to try to get my kids. You know, these, the kids, they get drawn into these kinds of things, more even so than even the parents. And the philosophy behind it is right here in verse 6. He comes to see me, he speaketh vanity, his heart gathereth iniquity to itself. When he goeth abroad, he telleth it. All that hate me whisper together against me, against me do they devise my hurt. That is the philosophy of the world right there. They're devising your hurt. They are not just trying to sell a movie. There's somebody who has devised a philosophy that they, and, a, and a, um, a, 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 uh, a story that they want to communicate to you. A worldly uh, a story that is destructive to your Christian uh, graces that we just spoke about. Merciful, forgiving, and all these other things that are Christ-like. The Spirit of God dwelling in your heart and having rule, they want to destroy those things. They don't want the Spirit of God to rule in your heart. And so our advice is just to be careful, to recognize that the system is out to get your kids. That's not just uh, hot air. That's the truth. They will tell you that. They will tell you we want to uh, get your children, and we know that we can't get them directly, so we'll use these things to get to your children. And they will get your children to like things and be exposed to philosophies that you would never teach them. And that's one of the dangers of the public school system. You want to teach your children to, um, that there's a God who created you and that, uh, that we depend upon the Bible. And it's difficult when for six and seven hours a day they're being taught something different than that by someone that they trust. That you have delegated the responsibility to teach your children and told your children, now go to school, they naturally listen to the teacher as an authority and naturally trust what the teacher is saying and then you have to undo that for the time that you have them from uh, the time they get off of school till about dinner time, at which time they go to bed and then they're doing their homework too. So you have an hour, maybe, to undo all the six and you don't even know what the teacher said. You know, you know what philosophy they communicated, it's a very dangerous thing, they seek your hurt. It's a philosophy, and they seek your hurt. So just be aware of it, so that you can be careful of it, and you can avoid it, and you can hope to protect your children. So, he says here, all that uh, hate me whisper together, and then verse 8, and, and evil disease say they cleaveth fast unto him, and now he that lieth, he shall rise up no more. You know, they are waiting for death to take its toll, and they're glad to see it when somebody is... Uh, when someone rebukes sin, they're glad to see them fall and to fail and to be sick and to die. 
the death of Christ was welcomed by the wicked. They were happy to see him die. They wanted him to die. The resurrection of Christ was not welcomed by the wicked. You know, we recognize that Christ was dying in our place. So we, we, uh, we have a lot of adoration for Christ as we think of him on the cross. And we think of Jesus on the cross and we, have, we, we worship and we recognize God is good to be on that cross dying for our sins. But then the wicked were happy to have him on that cross too, but for a different reason. They're happy to see him go. But he was not dying to go, he was dying to resurrect and to live. And therefore, we see him on that cross and we're thankful because we know the resurrection is, is next and we're, we're going to be a part of that resurrection. It's going to be good. And so we are happy to see him on that cross, not because we're happy to see him suffer, but it's our place. And that's a great reward. We know what's going to take place next. They did not. So here he says, verse 9, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. And you can see the Lord Jesus in that, as that passage of Scripture has a direct reference to Judas, who lifted up his heel against Christ. A friend of his who ate bread with him. And that phrase, uh, the, the uh, my known familiar friend, means a man of my peace. You know, he was betrayed by a man who he thought was at peace with him. And you know, it is going to be the case that you feel the sting of betrayal. From somebody that you love, from somebody that you trust, you will feel betrayal. How will you respond? What did Jesus do? He showed them forgiveness. He was hurt, nonetheless. He was hurt. But he was hurt only to the place that he cried out to God. He did not lift up his hand back against the one who lifted up his heel against him. And so he was uh, his own familiar friend. He trusted him. They ate bread together. And he lifted up, uh, he lifted up his heel against him. You know, if you suffer betrayal, remember that it is no more than your Savior did. He suffered. He suffered under the same difficulty. If you have, if you feel betrayed, remember that it was good for the Savior, and it made him, uh, it, it demonstrated the the goodness of God in His life and to you. Then remember that if it was good for Him, then it'll be good for you too. Don't be angry. Don't let that ugliness take over your life, but uh, give it to God. And then we find that He's proceeding in prayer in verse ten. He says, But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me, and raise me up, that I may requite them. You know, David goes on to prayer, and he asks to be raised up. He asks to re be recovered. You know, he, he, he sinned against God, and he wanted that forgiveness. And so we recognize that we want the forgiveness of God too when we sin. We want, to be re we want to be raised up to where we were, restored to fellowship with God. We want to begin to walk again in strength and faithfulness, the help that we had before we want again. And we should seek that recovery. The resurrection of Christ proves that Christ is greater than sin. He's greater than the power of sin. He's greater than the grave. And you and I have the privilege of being able to say to God, God, please forgive me, and knowing that we can be restored to full health. We can be restored to a full and good relationship with God, and we can even say, God, uh, restore me to where I was before, and we can walk again with God. And just because we fell, we fell hard, we fell on our face, we're ashamed of ourselves, and we think, oh, I can't ever live as a Christian, I'll never be able to get back right with God, I'll never get back to where I was, that's not true. You can walk with God again, and you can live for God, and you can have a right relationship today with God through forgiveness of your sins. The resurrection of Christ proves He's greater than the power sin has over us, so He'll forgive us. And we can then say, um, raise me up that, may, that I may requite them. You know, our enemies oftentimes are within. Our enemies are oftentimes our own selves. And we need to be able to say, Lord, raise me up so that I can prove to the flesh and the devil and, and the world that I'm not under its power. That you are greater than the world. He that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. Prove that you are a good and powerful God. So that I can say, God is the victor. God is greater than these things. That I can give a testimony and say, yes, I am I'm weak. Yes, I, I, make, I sin and I make errors. And yet, God is greater than these things. And he rewards me. I want, the, I want those enemies of mine to, to be beaten back for Christ's sake. And then he closes with thanksgiving to verse 11. 
And so he says here, By this I know that thou favorest me, because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. You know, we don't want the enemy to triumph over us. It's a good sign that you are walking with God if the enemy does not have the upper hand. Correct? If you are under the power of the enemy and the enemy is beating you down and the enemy is triumphing over you, that's not a good sign. It's a hard feeling. It makes you uh, miserable in your Christian life and you begin to even have doubts and questions. Am I really a Christian? Am I really saved? And you start to even doubt yourself. But listen, when you have the victory, by this I know that thou favorest me because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. When you have the victory, and you can say the victory is mine in Christ, and I can see it, then we have, uh, we have confidence in God, and we can see His favor. And that's what you need. You need to see His favor. You need to say, I know God favors me because He gave me victory over this sin. Victory over this sin. That's what I want. That's what I'll have. Then he says this, and, and as for me, thou upholdest me in mine integrity, and setteth me before thy face forever. We need that stability. We need stability. You know, there's one thing a Christian needs, and that's stability. Okay. So that we can walk with God and keep walking with God. So we don't keep falling down. It's wonderful to have the mercy of God. It's better to have the grace of God. Yeah. It's wonderful to be able to say, God, forgive me. It's another thing to say, God, continue to give me the victory and lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. It's better to have the victory than it is to have the forgiveness, but thank God for the forgiveness. Amen. We want the forgiveness. We don't want to turn it away, but we want the grace so that we're stable and we don't make these same errors over and over. Our integrity is too important to not seek out and to not, not hunt for, and to, to be uh, jealous over, and to, dis, and to desire it greatly. And he says this, verse 13, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting. He's closing with a blessing. He's blessing God, and God has made a covenant with us. He's the eternal God, and the, the goodness of God is eternal from everlasting to everlasting. God has covenanted with us in the, the word, the phrase, the God of Israel, he's reminding us of the covenant. The covenant that's been made with God. The God of Israel. The God of Israel, the covenant God. And this goodness of God, he says, is, from, is eternal. It's eternal. It's from everlasting to everlasting. And then he closed with this, Amen and Amen. You know, we all ought to reflect that. We all ought to be able to say, Amen and Amen. If you've been persecuted, and you've seen that somebody whom you love, someone that you have trusted, has, uh, has, has, has turned his back on you and betrayed you, then you can say amen and amen. You can double up on the amen. You can double up and you can say amen and amen. Because I've been betrayed, and I've seen that God is better, and He's good, and He's kept me through it. Amen and amen. If you've been persecuted, and you've seen the hand of God, you can say amen and amen. And when you consider the poor and you think about their, their, their situation, instead of being one who will persecute, you'll be one who will relieve burdens. And that's what God would have us to be, merciful rather than a persecutor. We're, we're on the path of helping rather than hurting. Amen. Mm -hmm. Dear Jesus, thank you for this message. Thank you for this great book. Lord, I would pray that you would... Let us sink deep into our hearts that it is mercy you desire. Mercy. I pray this, that you would bless us, with, Lord, with compassion. Help us not to betray our friends and our loved ones, Lord, but help us to be compassionate to them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.